Hi, my name is Tammy Uliano. I'm a doctor at the University of Florida, and I'm going to give a little talk on how to get your medical facts right. I'm a new author, soon to be published in March, which I'm very excited about. So to begin with, we're going to take a field trip to our simulation lab at the Harrow Medical Education Building. Your hero comes across... What's going on? He's here. He's, he's, he's down. Annie, Annie, are you okay? Because, you know, somebody might choose to lay in the middle of the hallway. So, if they're in an unsafe place, your hero needs to take them out of the middle of the highway so you don't all get smushed. And in which case, you need to be very careful to make sure that the neck is not injured during that. Uh, and one thing, this guy is laying supine, not prone. Prone means he's on his stomach and you can't really do anything for him. So don't say that your hero finds someone lying prone. If you were prone, you'd have to rotate him to supine, keeping his neck stable. So the first thing you do is check for a pulse. You can do that on his neck, on the thumb side of his wrist, or his groin, but if people are watching, that might not look so good. Um, don't squeeze both sides of the neck because you can stop blood flow. There's two vessels here. The carotid is the artery. The jugular is the vein. If the jugular is cut, you'll have a big welling of blood. If the carotid is cut, it will spray all over. So get those two terms correct. You feel a pulse, there isn't one. Prior to 2010, it would have been ABC. You check for breathing before you do anything else. Now it's CAB, circulation, then airway, then breathing. And so you find his sternum between the nipples, two hands, and you start doing compressions. In the meantime, you're getting someone to call 911. If there is no one else, then you can ask Siri to call 911. The rate needs to be about 100 beats per minute. And so you can sing Stayin' Alive to yourself or Another One Bites the Dust, but that seems a little bit depressing. And the amount of pressure you apply should be enough to move the chest about two inches. So you're doing that at about 100 beats per minute. Normally we would trade people every few minutes because it's very tiring. Um, if you have a second person then they, and they know how, they can try and do uh, mouth to mouth. Most people don't want to do that. And it turns out you can actually move enough air just by doing chest compressions. And then if you're in a place that has an external defibrillator, you'll bring that in. This is fancier than most AEDs, automated external defibrillators. They're normally just in a little bright yellow or bright red case but they tell you right on the screen where to place the pads. One on the chest and the other on the side. Analyzing heart rhythm. Shock advised. Stay clear of patient. Deliver shock now. Press the shock delivered. Patient doesn't jerk or anything like they show on TV. It, uh, you might hear a thunk and then you look at the rhythm and now it's back to sinus. You'll confirm that with a pulse check. So you don't have to do chest compressions. We saved him, yay. If the patient is still not breathing, then we'll have to protect their airway. So we slide this laryngoscope in, lift up and we get a view of their vocal cords. Then we slide a tube between the cords and then we can ventilate them through that tube. Once our found down guy makes it to the hospital, then when next our hero sees him, he'll probably be attached to a bunch of monitors. We just talked about him getting this breathing tube placed into his airway, so let's talk about some of the other things that he's attached to. First, he's going to have a monitor overhead that should be visible with many different tracings on it, and the tracings are dependent on what's going on with him. So the first we'll talk about is this EKG. Everybody's familiar with that. It comes from these electrodes that are attached um, underneath their gown. Usually there's five, sometimes up to 12, and they're in very specific locations. And those locations determine what kind of shape 
this looks like approximately. From the EKG, we can pretty easily calculate a heart rate. 60 is very low, and when you hear a beep in the background, it should equal this. So obviously that's more important for television and movies, but it's pretty funny when there's a very fast beep and this is 60 and these are going by really slowly because that doesn't correlate at all. The next thing on this monitor is the NIBP, non-invasive blood pressure, and that comes from a cuff placed on the upper arm. That cuff goes on not the side with the IV or else the IV will back up every time it is run. And this bottom number is the saturation, that's the percent of oxygen in the blood, so 100% is as high as you can get, 98 is normal. And that comes from this tracing, which needs to approximately line up with the EKG, or that's completely inaccurate. And then that comes from this, what's called a pulse oximeter probe, attached to the finger, which will glow red, and people call it their ET finger. So this is one type of pulse oximeter, and then if it's a newborn on their cute little foot, we wrap it all the way around because we don't have ones tiny enough for their toes. The next thing you'll see him besides the pulse oximeter down here, he's going to have an IV somewhere, usually on the same hand as the pulse oximeter and not the one with the blood pressure cuff. And there's a couple things to know about the IV. First of all, it's not an IV needle. There is a needle that's part of the insertion, there's a catheter on top of the needle, you can see it put together here, but once we get it into the vein, we take the needle out. So all that's left is a flexible tiny piece of plastic. And that piece of plastic always points toward the heart, never away from the heart. There's one little trick we have now, which is called a vein finder, and you can see that as long as the veins are reasonably superficial, so not under several inches of um, other tissue, then we can see exactly where we want to go when we like to go in these little V's where it'll hold still and we can go up like that. So that's a vein finder. If you have trouble getting IVs, ask your nurse to use one. If we really need big honking IV access because the patient is expected to be bleeding a bunch, so trauma patients, then we want to get a much larger IV than we could put peripherally down in your arm. And so instead we go right into the central circulation. So this would be right above your collarbone. This would be in the side of your neck. It goes into your jugular vein, not your carotid. And this allows us to give fluid or blood much faster. There's a bunch of stuff we don't want to accidentally poke up here, including the carotid artery. And so we tend to do it under ultrasound guidance. So this is an ultrasound probe and it gives us this very nice image of the jugular vein. And so this is the needle coming down into that vein and then we can thread the cap. Once we have this IV, it's attached to a pump and our fluids are in the hospital pretty much always going through a pump now. Um, in the operating room is about the only time we'll ever free flow fluids coming from an IV bag. And these IV bags should always be labeled and they double check them and they have a separate nurse come in and confirm that it's really the bag that they think it is. And we're very careful about that because that's one of the most common medical errors is these uh, drugs, either the programming of the pump incorrectly or the wrong drug being hung. So the last thing to talk about here is the ventilator. And this is what we talked about before, putting the breathing tube in. So this is pushing gas down one tube into the lungs and back out the other tube. But remember that this tube goes through the vocal cords. And so the only way to make sounds with your vocal cords is for them to vibrate against each other. And if this tube is in the way, then they cannot make any sounds. They can't grunt, they can't moan, they can't squeal in any way. One of the most common hilarious mistakes that um, healthcare workers will recognize when reading fiction is the intubated patient who communicates um, their distress audibly. Um, 
they might be able to bang on the bed, but they cannot talk in any way. And in fact, usually um, we'll have a wrist restraint here that's tied to the side of the bed to keep them from accidentally pulling this tube out. Because if you saw when I was putting it in the mannequin, there's a cuff on the end, which we blow up. And if you pull that out without deflating the cuff, you can damage the vocal cords. If the patient doesn't really need us to breathe for them, but they do need extra oxygen, then we'll do these nasal cannula, which you've certainly seen on television. And this is hooked to an oxygen supply source, usually on the wall. If we don't add a humidifier to that, then it can be very drying and uncomfortable. And so if your patient needs to have a nasal cannula, you could talk about how it smells like a beach ball because it's plastic, that it's uncomfortable and cold in their nose, very drying, um, and it makes some people cough quite a bit. So some other nitpicky facts that those of us in healthcare and not just physicians would prefer that you get right in your fiction. First of all, historical fiction is a huge area where there can be problems with this. Um, I've read books where they talked about hand washing um, for doctors before hand washing was actually realized to be important. So before the mid-19th century, at least in the West, we didn't realize that bugs were causing a lot of the infections and it wasn't recommended that doctors wash their hands. And in fact, midwives were way ahead of us on that. Antibiotics didn't really appear until the mid 20th century. So if you're going to have somebody in World War II getting antibiotics, it better be the only one that was available back then. And it was not commonly available. Recently, I read a book where a hero was really tired, but he needed to go into the final part of the book ready to find the enemy. And so he asked a doctor to give him an amp of epinephrine, which is possible to do. It would likely kill him, um, but it certainly wouldn't give him the energy he needs to chase down the bad guy. Um, given is a muscular injection so that it comes into the bloodstream gradually, it's still only going to last about 15 minutes. Um, we generally don't use epinephrine unless somebody is dying. Um, Poisons, um, a very common question that I see on websites is what poison will cause this, that, or the other. And honestly, the public, including healthcare professionals, know a whole lot less about poisons than they do about some of these other things. And we're not going to be as bothered if you make up your own poison. Um, if you do care to get it closer to right, then there's someone um, who has been given the moniker the poison lady, Lucy Zare who gives talks, uh, has a website, and has published books on poisons. And then our own Doug Lyle has a website where he's addressed this and also has published books on poisons um, used historically to kill people. Recently, I watched a television show based on a novel where the bad guy was injected with a paralytic and then lay on the floor, eyes open, looking around, breathing fine, but couldn't move any other muscles. Again, that drug does not exist. Any of our paralytics affect all voluntary muscles. So the heart's not going to stop right away, but you can't breathe. And so eventually the heart's going to stop. And certainly you can't keep your eyes open and move your eyes around. And finally, if you are looking these things up, be careful where you get your information. And that's true during COVID and it's true during everything else. If you're looking for actual medical information, either ask someone in a medical field, look for websites that end in .edu, that's a university. WebMD has some great information. The National Institutes of Health, CDC. Wikipedia actually does a really good job on most medical topics. And then obviously going to one of us who's happy to help um, is another option. And I am one of those on my website. I have a blog where I answer medical questions. Often the questions are not something I can write a whole blog about. And so I just answer by email or you can email me directly. And I'm happy to try to help you get your medical facts. Thank you and stay safe.